Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to be discussing the basics of the brain ventricles, but mainly focus on the circulation of cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF, through those ventricles. So first, let's define cerebrospinal fluid. Okay. Cerebrospinal fluid is a fluid that is derived from blood, and it's made specifically by cells in tissues called choroid plexuses. We're going to see that each one of the brain ventricles actually has a choroid plexus. These are clusters of cells that take blood, actual arterial blood, and they basically selectively take certain parts of the blood, and they move it into the ventricles as a new fluid called cerebrospinal fluid and it contains a lot of ions in it. It still contains nutrients. Okay? It does not contain proteins. It serves some of the same functions as blood. For example, it's able to remove wastes from the brain, from the central nervous system. It can deliver nutrients, although generally the brain's gonna rely more on the blood directly than it will cerebrospinal fluid for nutrient delivery. But CSF still can perform that function. But one of the other main things it does is it circulates around the brain and around the central nervous system in the subarachnoid space, and it actually sh serves as more of a cushion and a shock absorber. Okay? It's mostly for protection of the brain, although it does allow the removal of wastes back into the venous blood. And we'll talk more about that removal into the venous blood in the next video, where we actually talk about the dural venous sinuses or the cranial sinuses. Cranial sinuses are going to be something that we see that drains cerebrospinal fluid. There's actually one of those sinuses up here at the top, the superior sagittal sinus. And we'll see later on that this sinus and many more actually drain cerebrospinal fluid that's circulating in the subarachnoid space and return it to the venous circulation. Here we're just going to focus on how the cerebrospinal fluid is made and the course that it takes throughout the central nervous system. But before we do that, we need to get a basic understanding of what are called the brain ventricles, and there are four of them. Okay? The four ventricles are the two lateral ventricles. There's a left and a right lateral ventricle. There's a third ventricle and a fourth ventricle. Now, again, you'll notice there's not a first and second ventricle listed here. That's because the first and second ventricles are the lateral ventricles. Okay? So these are ventricles one and two. And then you have a third ventricle, and then you have a fourth ventricle. Now here, if we look at the side or lateral view of the brain, it might appear like all of these are on the midline. However, only a few select structures here are on the midline of the body. For example, inferiorly, the central canal, the fourth ventricle, the cerebral aqueduct, and the third ventricle. Those structures are on the midline of the body. But when we turn this and look uh, anteriorly at the brain, or posteriorly, depending, we see that the two lateral ventricles are actually not on the midline of the brain, whereas the third ventricle, cerebral aqueduct, fourth ventricle, and central canal are. So when we're looking at these ventricles, we need to remember that the two lateral ventricles actually flank the midline on either side. Okay? And so if we have a mid-sagittal cut of the brain, we really just have to estimate where one of these lateral ventricles is. We're not actually looking at it directly. We'd actually have to dig farther into the brain laterally in order to see the lateral ventricles. So just keep that in mind. But the one thing I do want to mention is that this, these lateral ventricles are the original site of the synthesis of cerebrospinal fluid. And the lateral ventricles are going to make that cerebrospinal fluid with their choroid plexuses. And we'll be talking about the exact nature of the choroid plexus in two videos from now, in a lot more detail. But for now, understand the lateral ventricles have choroid plexuses. The third ventricle and fourth ventricle also have choroid plexuses. And so as the cerebrospinal fluid circulates through the ventricles, there's going to be cerebrospinal fluid added by subsequent choroid plexuses in the in the uh, subsequent ventricles. All right, so now we're gonna go back to looking at a mid-sagittal view of the brain. And the reason I know that this is exactly a mid-sagittal cut and not a parasagittal or just regular sagittal is because I can see the superior sagittal sinus in this picture. This sinus, which is gonna be responsible for draining some of the cerebrospinal fluid superiorly, is present on the midline of the body. It's right on the mid-sagittal plane directly above the longitudinal fissure of the brain, which separates the hemispheres into left and right. All right, so let's start talking about this. So right here, okay, 
uh, this kind of sh a slightly shaded area. It's not quite opaque, kind of a little bit half transparent right here. This is one of the lateral ventricles. Now when we're looking at this mid-sagittal view, over here is anterior, and over here we have the cerebellum, so this is posterior. So they've actually removed the left half of the brain, and you're seeing the inside of the right hemisphere right here. So this ventricle right here is the right lateral ventricle. Remember, the lateral ventricles do not exist on the midline. So if you're at a mid-sagittal cut, you have to kind of extrapolate or estimate where the lateral ventricle is. And so that's why this is kind of half transparent, half opaque. So hopefully that makes sense. So here is a right lateral ventricle. And the lateral ventricle, of course, has a choroid plexus. And that choroid plexus is actually shown right here. Okay? Notice that it's going to be generating cerebrospinal fluid. Okay? In fact, both the left and right lateral ventricles do this. And as soon as the lateral ventricles, using their choroid plexuses, make that cerebrospinal fluid, the cerebrospinal fluid moves through a hole called the interventricular foramen. And from the interventricular foramen, the cerebrospinal fluid passes from the lateral ventricles into the third ventricle. The third ventricle is this space kind of right here. Okay, so you can see that the CSF generated by the choroid plexus in the lateral ventricle, it accumulates and then moves through this interventricular foramen into the third ventricle. So now we're in the third ventricle. The third ventricle also has a choroid plexus right here. Here's a choroid plexus, okay? So it's generating cerebrospinal fluid and adding it onto the cerebrospinal fluid that already came through that interventricular foramen. So each step you get added CSF. And so you have cerebrospinal fluid here in the third ventricle. Now, from the third ventricle, that cerebrospinal fluid moves through the cerebral aqueduct. It's this thin region right here that kind of traverses between the two halves of the midbrain. So here's the anterior half of the midbrain, and then here's the corpora quadrigemina, the posterior half. And this ductwork that runs between them is the cerebral aqueduct. So CSF moves from the third ventricle through the cerebral aqueduct, and then finally into this region called the fourth ventricle. And in general, the fourth ventricle is really just between the cerebellum and the pons right here. Okay, So this is your fourth ventricle right here. Now, the fourth ventricle is important because, as you can see right here, the fourth ventricle has four holes or four apertures through which the cerebrospinal fluid can move. So you can see four of them right here. There's a left and a right lateral aperture. Okay, here's one of the apertures. This would actually be the right lateral aperture. The left one would, of course, have been removed when the left half of the brain was taken away. So this is the right lateral aperture, but there's two of them, left and right. There is a median aperture, which you can see right here. And then there's the central canal of the spinal cord inferiorly. So these holes, all four of them, are spaces that allow cerebrospinal fluid to move or circulate into the subarachnoid space. So for example, once the cerebrospinal fluid is in the fourth ventricle, it can move through either the left or right lateral apertures, and then it gets into the subarachnoid space and circulates there. Here's the median aperture. Again, cerebrospinal fluid can move from the fourth ventricle through that median aperture, and again, circulate in the subarachnoid space. And notice here, if it goes through the median aperture, okay, it can either go through the subarachnoid space of the spinal cord right here, or it can actually go around the cerebellum. Okay? And then here's the central canal of the spinal cord. Again, that's the fourth path passageway for the cerebrospinal fluid exiting the fourth ventricle. It can go down the central canal of the spinal cord, and then eventually it'll go into the subarachnoid space. So all four of these, the cerebrospinal fluid will go to these and then eventually end up in the subarachnoid space. And you can see right here, all this space right here in this light blue, all of this, this is all subarachnoid space, and you should follow the arrows around. Here's more subarachnoid space going down through the spinal cord or going posterior and around the cerebellum. This is all subarachnoid space. And that's the main area where cerebrospinal fluid circulates. And it protects the brain, so let's say in the case that the head were to be hit with blunt force trauma. Okay? Provides a shock absorber, a cushioning effect, but also allows the drainage of waste and in some cases delivery of nutrients. Okay? Now, again, when you're looking at the subarachnoid space right here, 
This is where the cerebrospinal fluid circulates. Cerebrospinal fluid picks up wastes. And so this CSF can't remain in the subarachnoid space indefinitely. It's going to have to be cleared at some point. And so the way it's going to be cleared are these little bulges right here that penetrate from the subarachnoid space into the cranial sinuses. Okay? Let's take a look at one of those. So right here, we see, here's the subarachnoid space. There's this little bulge right here that kind of penetrates out of the subarachnoid space and into this dark blue area, which is one of the dural venous sinuses. This one is specifically the superior sagittal sinus. And this bulge right here is called the arachnoid granulation. And this exiting of the cerebrospinal fluid through the arachnoid granulation into one of these cranial sinuses, also called dural venous sinuses, allows the cerebral spinal fluid to circulate out, and then the ventricles, their choroid plexuses, can generate more CSF. And that's necessary because that CSF is going to be getting rid of nutrients and picking up wastes, just like blood. If you have a way to generate it, you have to have a way to get rid of it. And these arachnoid granulations are a way to do that. And so once this CSF ends up in, let's say, this sinus, the superior sagittal sinus, it will ultimately uh, be delivered back to the general venous circulation uh, via the internal jugular vein. And we'll be talking about that more extensively in the next video. But what I wanted to get at in this video is really just how the brain, that is the ventricles, generate cerebrospinal fluid via these choroid plexuses, how the CSF then uh, moves through those ventricles, and then ultimately how it gets into the subarachnoid space, and then how that CSF leaves the subarachnoid space and then gets into the dural venous sinuses, or the cranial sinuses, as they're often called. And again, this is just one of those sinuses. There's a lot of others that we're going to talk about. So catch us in the next video where we talk about uh, the flow of the cerebrospinal fluid from the subarachnoid space into these dural venous sinuses and then how these dural venous sinuses connect with each other to ultimately deliver blood back to the internal jugular vein and the entire venous system. After that, we'll take a jump back to this topic and we'll talk in more detail about choroid plexus. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. Thank you.